All right. It says recording on your end, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to check real quick. Okay. So again, thank you so much for chatting with us. Um, we're super excited to dive into everything today. Um, as you know, the focus of this interview series um, is the many ways that people can get into publishing because we know there's, there's just various paths that you can kind of take. There's no one size fits all kind of deal. So you've told us that you had a, a kind of non-traditional path into publishing. What can you tell us about your journey to becoming a published author or how you began writing and, and just take us, take us on that journey, that arc? So my journey is unusual in that I got a book deal without a literary agent. And then I did acquire a literary agent about a year later for a different book. So I had, I'd known since the age of 14 that I'd wanted to become an author and kind of didn't really know how to do that for a long time. So I wrote all during high school and then at the University of Arizona, I uh, studied creative writing. So um, wrote lots of adult literary fiction because that's what the, the classes were focusing on at the time. Um, then after I finished my graduate degree, I decided I really want to focus on getting my own writing career going. So I wrote and queried book after book. We Are the Fire was the third manuscript that I had written and was trying to query with agents. And my critique partners and my beta readers, they loved this book. I had a passion for this book as well that I hadn't felt for my previous two projects even though I really loved them and they meant a lot to me, this one was unique. And I think part of it was because it came out of such a, a hard time for me and such a difficult experience in my life. And beta readers and critique partners love this book too. They said, this is the one. But agents weren't responding to it the same way. And it was very difficult and very heartbreaking for me. And this was a book I didn't want to give up on. And I knew about a website called Swoon Reads where fantasy authors or, or YA authors in any genre could put their manuscript on the website and the community could read all the manuscripts, review them, respond to them, rate them, and ones that performed well could get the attention of an editor at the Swoon Reads imprint. And Swoon Reads is an imprint of Macmillan, one of the big five. And I was like, okay, this is a way I could potentially get into a big five publisher without an agent. And I thought agents are struggling to connect with this story, but readers love it. Maybe readers can help me get this book published. So I put it up on the website and a few months later got an email from one of the editors at Swoon Reads saying they wanted to talk to me. And it was an offer of publication for this book. And then later on, I got my agent through a connection with a fellow Swoon Reads author who said that one of her longtime friends who'd been in publishing for 17 years was switching over to agenting. And did this author know anyone who was looking for a literary agent? And quite a few of us among the Swoon Reads authors were. And that was when I was working on my YA fantasy, uh, historical fantasy set in Iceland. And so, I emailed this agent and I was like, hey, I understand you're looking for some authors. Uh, here's this manuscript I have. A few days later, she emails me back and says, Iceland is one of my favorite places in the world. Send me this story. And the next month, she offered representation. And when I was speaking with her on the phone, we clicked. And I knew at that time, this is the agent I've been looking for for four years. She just wasn't an agent yet. I just had to wait for her to become an agent and in the meantime, I got to become a much better author. I got to be connected with fellow authors who I might not have crossed paths with if I hadn't been looking for an agent all that time. Wow, I love that story. Thank you. Uh, so your forthcoming YA fantasy debut, We Are the Fire, releases February 16th, and Pine Reads was fortunate enough to receive an ARC, um, as Hannah's showing here. So would you mind briefly summarizing the story and characters for those who aren't yet familiar with it? Sure. So We Are the Fire will appeal to fans of An Ember in the Ashes or The Legend of Spartacus. It's about two fire-wielding teen soldiers in love who are pitted against each other as they fight against the empire who kidnapped them from home. And it's full of 
fire magic, lovers at odds, gray morals, twisted alchemy, fantastic friendships, and a lot of fun folklore. Okay, so I know Wendy and I are both really excited to, to ask what inspired you to write this story because it is so unique. It really felt the world, the magic, the characters felt like they'd never really come to come to any bookshelves yet. So, so what was that initial kernel of inspiration for you? Was it the world? Was it the characters? Was it like something else entirely? What, what, what initially inspired you to write this book? So I wrote this book because I was really angry and I wanted to watch something burn. My day job at the time was run by some pretty corrupt people and I didn't always know what the right thing to do was. I wanted to make the situation better, but the right answers weren't always clear. It wasn't always clear who could help us, um, who we could trust to get us out of the mess. and. So I would just come home from work every day so angry and just wanting to set fire to something. So I was turned to this story in part as a way to vent out my anger. And Oksana, I believe, was the first one who came to me. And I could just see this, this young girl with the power to burn, but it wasn't a power she had been born with. And it wasn't a power she'd chosen to have. And she was being made to burn for a cause she didn't believe in. And so from there, I had to ask myself, well, then where did these powers come from? Why does she have them? Why is she burning for a cause she doesn't believe in? And how does she get out of this mess? And I wanted a story where the right answers aren't always obvious or clear, like in my own situation, because sometimes even when you're trying to do the right thing, you, you don't know what that right thing is. And you try and you try and find it. And sometimes the, the right choice or the right action still comes with a lot of really steep and difficult consequences. And I was trying to capture that in the story as well. But ultimately, I wanted to write a story where there was hope in the end that despite the ambiguity of what the right thing is, despite the difficult choices, the characters are able to reclaim their future and to make a better life for themselves. And, because I feel, especially for books, for, for younger readers, for teenagers, they need to have aspects of hope and to come away with that promise. My personal opinion, I think that you definitely accomplished that. Thank you. Um, so one of my favorite elements of We Are the Fire is the world. Um, and it's expansive and magical in its construction, especially with the fa fascinating but very deadly <laughs> scientific elements of it. Um, so how did you go about building this world? And what's one fun fact that readers don't get a chance to discover on page, but might be interested to know about the world? So I was playing with a lot of different folklore ideas um, and especially spinning off alchemy. Did a lot of research on alchemy as it had existed in our world and then spun that into an alchemy in this book that isn't about um, trans you know, changing metals into gold or finding the philosopher's stone or the elixir of life, but it's about turning ordinary people, kids into these fire wielding creatures. So I came up with the, the very kiwi, the very incendiary chemical or mineral that is key to the alchemical process and kind of came up with a story behind the very kiwi stones and even the name of the soldiers, the, the ancient fire demons that were said to walk this land before it was Vesema who had left behind the very kiwi stones and they were seen as like protectors of the land or, or symbols of, of strength and freedom. And that was supposed to be the idea behind these soldiers um, a fun tidbit that doesn't make it onto the page, but was definitely key to the inspiration. So the, the demon's tongue chemical in this book that was very incendiary, it can burn underwater. That was inspired by Greek fire from history, which is the, the chemical that it's not well understood, but pretty legendary that Greek fighting ships could set aflame their, their enemy ships at bay with this, this chemical that was said to be able to burn on the water or underwater. So that was where I got the idea for the demon's tongue chemical, which becomes so important in the story. 
I loved the name Demon's Tongue. <laughs> I just have to compliment you on that. I thought that was so kick butt. I don't know. I just loved it. Demon's Tongue just sounds so cool. Um, and uh, just the way you set up the science, I loved that it it wasn't just magic. Uh, there was some like sciencey elements in there too. I feel like it grounds it in like a a, a realistic sense, I guess, that I could see this happening in, in some sort of magical world, which I really enjoyed. Um, okay, so moving on, you, you've hinted at this in some of your past answers that this is not just a story of like fighting for freedom, but it's also a love story. Um, and what, what I really enjoyed and what I think Wendy really enjoyed is that rather than being about a, a blooming romance between two characters where part of the story is about them getting together for the first time, Oksana and Pran, it's Pran, right? It's not Pran. We've Pran. debated this. It's Pran. Pran. Okay. Oh, Pran. Okay. So Oksana and Pran, um, they're together from the start, from the very first chapter. And the story kind of develops as they become at odds with each other based on this, this intense situation that they found themselves in. So what was it like writing the arc of their relationship? Because they do start out as a couple and then kind of uh, you know, don't grow apart, but they definitely clash throughout. So in the very, very first draft of this story, they were originally hated each other and were intense rivals and were just like completely like trying to tear each other down the whole story until at the end when they like started reconciling, coming to amends and I wrote that very, very sloppy, bare bones draft. And I got to the end of the story and I thought, you know, there'd be a lot more emotional stakes if they were together the whole time, but also clashing in a lot of their, their viewpoints, their, their ideas of right and wrong, their lines of what they will cross to get their freedom. Um, so I, I, I decided to write them you know, already being together, a, a lot of books, they show the characters coming together. And that's a big part of the plot is how their romance begins, how they get together. And this, I wanted to look at what happens after two young characters get together. So it's still a first love story. It's just a little bit later on. And they've, they just came to rely on each other organically through all that they'd been to and how they really needed each other, you know, Pran needing Oksana to help him stay alive and Oksana needing Pran to give him to give her a reason to keep going in this terrible place and it just I thought it would be interesting angle on the story and and another romance for teen readers to see is like so these characters are together how do they stay together what does it look like staying together in such difficult circumstances where they often can't agree on what the right thing to do is. I loved the romance of it. I'm a huge fan of romance. And so I think it was a really fun journey to go on having them be together from the beginning. We don't often see that part of books because you normally just see them get together. You don't see what happens after that. So I think it was, it definitely was a really fun thing about this book to just kind of see what happens next and how they actually get to interact with each other. Um, so um, in their fight for freedom, as you've kind of mentioned before, both Oksana and Pran are complicated characters who have to make several hard choices throughout the book. So how did you find writing morally gray protagonists? Did you find yourself connecting with one of them more than the other? It was challenging. Like there's a lot of scenes in the book that were very difficult for me to write and even editing them over many, many drafts, they never got easier. But I really wanted to dig deep into these questions I was presenting in the story and I didn't wanna shy away from them. I didn't wanna do a disservice to the characters or the readers or sugarcoat these, these issues that I was talking about and the, the very real challenges the characters face. Um, I definitely see parts of myself in Prawn, like the ambition, the determination to achieve what he wants to do are definitely there. I, I don't think I take it quite as far as he does in the, you know, kind of the, the willingness to do whatever it takes and some of the very great lines he crosses and steps into. I mean, part 
part of Pran's struggle is he bites off way more than he can chew. He's over ambitious in his expectations of himself and it comes to haunt him. And I see a lot of myself in Oksana too, and that she desperately wants to be a good person. And she has very clear ideas of what she thinks is right and what she thinks is wrong and does not want to cross the line at all into what she thinks is wrong, wrong, even if it comes kind of at her own expense or, you know, sometimes you know, she's, she's trying to figure out how much of myself do I give in order to take care of the people around me and her definitions of what's right and what's wrong and her place in that really changes over time. And I have seen that in myself as well, like reevaluating my views of the world, my understanding of the world and my place in it and what I can do and um, making decisions that would have been hard for me before. But, you know, as I grow to learn more about the world and how it works and the people in it and my place in it, I come away as, a, I hope, a, a more nuanced and complex person. The same is true for Exana. Yeah, I mean, what I loved, I'm a character reader. And so I loved reading this book because it is so character driven and you're very much able to immerse yourself as a reader into their respective mindsets, I guess. And while they are definitely united in what they're fighting for, the ways they go, might go about it are perhaps different in, in certain instances. And so I loved that. Just a question for you. So did you always plan to write this as like a dual, like a dual narrative, like switching between two perspectives and having two characters? Or, or was there an earlier draft where it was just Oksana? Or how did, how did you go about constructing like POV and how that might compare those two mindsets? Sure. Yeah. So I had always planned for this to be a dual point of view between Oksana and Prawn because, um, you know, even in the very early draft when they were like intense enemies and hated each other, a big part of the story momentum was their very different plans for how to uh, defeat their commanders and free themselves from the four and how their plans sometimes even kind of clash or conflict with each other and cause whole new problems. That was always a big part of the story and, you know, showing the different ways of looking at right and wrong and how to get out of the situation and, um, and how their plans ultimately come together and support each other. That was, that was always how I envisioned the story. And I love, I love to see that, that, them coming, you know, breaking apart and then trying to find their way back to each other, I think was really emotionally touching for me. And I think Wendy as well, uh, because they were already together. I think that's, that's what makes this story unique is it's not just about them coming together for the first time, but coming back together, which is uh, just, I don't know, really touching and really poignant. So switching gears a little bit, one of the central themes in We Are the Fire is about building a home, even if it's not the one you imagine for yourself, because all of these soldiers are, are being, or most of them are being taken from their homelands and being forced um, into a role that they, they didn't want. So what message do you want readers to come away with regarding belonging and found family in We Are the Fire? So I want them to, to see that you know, even if they are apart from their, their immediate blood family, or even if there's clashes with their immediate blood family, that there's always going to be people there who can support them, who can understand them, who can check them when they need to be called out, and who can give them a boost when they need someone to pick them up and, and push them forward again. I've um, in my own life, I've come across many situations where there's been someone to, to be a parent for me, to be a sister or a brother for me, to be a grandma for me or an aunt for me when I need that extra help. And that's here for these teen characters who they're not with their families, but they're, they're teens and they still very much need support and guidance and they have to learn to give that to each other or even with you know, some characters in the book who they maybe would not have initially thought of as friends, but become that friends and that strength to them. And it, it's encouraging for the characters who recognize that, that 
you know, even though they may be lonely and scared and not sure what to do, they recognize the support that they can give each other. And that's what makes all the difference and can keep them going. And the same is true for, for teens now that even, you know, if they're, they're struggling to, to feel seen, to feel heard, there will be people around them who can help them feel supported. Yeah, I think that message definitely comes across and it's a very important one, especially right now in all the things that we're going through. Yes. Um, so you kind of hinted that at this a little bit earlier, but what were your favorite moments in We Are the Fire to Write? And were there any parts that you found more difficult to write? And then do you have a favorite quote? Ooh. So um, one of my favorite scenes ever to work on is the smoke bomb scene when Oksana gets to put a little bit of her chemistry knowledge to use and, and make that smoke bomb. It was more fun for me than like writing any of the kissing scenes because kissing scenes are very hard for me to write. I actually had to get a romance writer friend of mine to help me with the kissing scene because they were just not working. But I love that smoke bomb scene and Another favorite scene of mine, it's very, very far into the book. It's almost spoilery, so I won't say too much, but there's there's the scene at fire night where Oksana and Pawn leap over a bonfire together. And that was always one of my favorite scenes. I had that very early on in one of the first drafts of the book. At one point I had to cut that scene out and I was devastated because that scene is just so touching to me and just so special. And then when I was revising the book with my editor, we made so many changes to the story that were very difficult to make, but I got to a place where I could bring that scene back in and I was just elated to have that special scene in the book. And I'm so excited that the final copy includes it. Difficult scenes, I mean, there's, this book goes to some dark places and they were not fun to write. I could tell that the story was going to some of these places and I knew that I needed to include them. There's, there's one scene in particular that's major spoilery, so I won't say it, but I tried to have um, Prawn not go that way and have him do something else. And, and some of my early readers called me out on that. And they're like, you've been setting this up the whole story. You can't have him just run away. He's got to do the thing. So yeah, this just, it goes dark places and it's difficult to write. Some of the scenes with the alchemist would leave me so angry and I'd have to step away from my computer and just like walk it off. Cause I was so upset with this evil character, but um, it, uh, I was just trying to to look very real at some of the, the darkness that is in the world, but also how to get through that. With the favorite scene, Hannah and I were talking right before you came on about what our favorite scenes were. And that was the one that I said with the jumping over of the bonfire. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. I loved it. Oh my goodness. Okay. So, um, Having gone through the entire publishing process at this point, if you could give any advice to the version of yourself who was writing the first draft of We Are the Fire or to just anybody who's an aspiring author out there, what would it be? I think I would have to tell myself to just, you know, relax a little bit more. I, I put so much of myself and especially my self-worth into achieving this dream and into having my manuscripts get me an agent and get published and be well liked by people. And so much of that is just out of our control. And it's really not always a question of, you know, the, the quality of the work or how well I've mastered the creative elements. It's, it's so much about luck and timing and there was times I would be really hard on myself when things didn't seem like they were turning out the way I hoped and it cuts into creativity it it cuts into my happiness with the craft it cuts into how well I'm able to was able to connect with other writers and help boost them and celebrate their journeys and so you know um if I could go back, I would say like, just relax, just enjoy this time, just enjoy the 
the wonderful parts of being able to create stories and create worlds and and characters and have writer friends read them and love them and find great things to be excited about and you know if you persevere you'll eventually get to the people who will champion your work and sometimes it can take years sometimes like with my own agent they will come they're just not in that spot yet where they can help you out but if you keep writing the stories, if you keep working on your craft, if you keep finding your writer friends and supporting them and being there for them, like you'll all get to where you need to be in the end. I think that's some wonderful advice. And as an aspiring author myself, I will take it. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Um, So finally, what's next for you? Can we possibly expect a sequel to We Are the Fire or to the Iceland manuscript that you were talking about earlier? (laughs) So the Iceland manuscript right now, my agent is sending it out to editors. So we're trying to find a home for it. And hopefully we do because that story is also extremely important to me. And I am fighting to see that book in print. Um, as for a sequel to We Are the Fire, depends on how well the book does. I would love to continue exploring a little bit more of this world and these characters. Um, so we'll see if, if the book sells really well and is well received. Could be, but in the meantime, I'm working on a lot of different other projects. I have another YA fantasy inspired by some Greek mythology and set in a creepy forest. And I'm also dipping my toes into middle grade. So I have one middle grade that has full of baking magic and baking shenanigans. It's super, super fun. I love that book. I love to bake and, and make desserts. So that one is just delightful to work on. And I am just started work on another middle grade fantasy that's inspired by Norwegian folklore. Um, and I'm really enjoying middle grade. Like, if you'd asked me a year ago if I'd ever write middle grade, I would have said no. Like I just, I'm a YA writer, but um, I, I started diving into it because with all the, the, the darkness of last year of 2020, and there was a lot of really difficult personal obstacles in my life and my YA, but it's always so dark. I try to write lighter YA and it just doesn't happen. Like there's suddenly there's a dead body in the woods. And I was like, okay, I guess we're going there. But I was like, I need some lighter stories for, for me, like for my own mental health. So I was like, I'm, I'm going to try writing some, some middle grade. And I started reading a lot more middle grade last year. Some of my friends were publishing their, their middle grade books. And I just really started loving it and writing the middle grade voice and just that, that lighter outlook on life where you know, magic is a very real possibility, even here in our real world to, to such younger characters and readers. It's just been so much fun. So I've really been enjoying that. All of those sound amazing. Wendy and I are huge fans of Greek mythology. So we will definitely be keeping our ears out for that. And also the Norwegian folklore sounds extremely cool. Um, and I know Wendy reads a lot of middle grade and I try to as well. So that's really exciting that you have so many projects in the work. Um, We're excited for you and also excited for us because we will get to read them (laughs) when they come out. Yes. Yeah, and I think that that kind of wraps it up. (laughs) I think so. Do you have anything else that you wanna share or talk about? Um, No, just another plug for my book out February 16th. And it is available wherever you can buy books and I hope you read it and I hope you like it as much as I do. And as much as we do, because Wendy and I can attest to this book. It is phenomenal if you like fantasy, if you like fighting for freedom, if you like romance. It really does such a great job of having all these different elements. And you just do an amazing job of bringing them together for just a fast-paced, really, really amazing story. So we're excited for other people to get the opportunity to read this book. Thank you so much. Thank you for reading it.